something else but first i promised you a great putin clip uh, it has nothing to do with the hacking but uh there's a uh, a translating voice and it's the guy martin whatever his name is from cnbc the british guy and he they're talking about oil prices and putin is of course you know oil is a really important deal for russia and he's talking about the price of oil and he's, he feels it is going to uh, adjust upwards and he makes an assertion that the United States needs $80 a barrel in order, which I think is high, but he would probably know better, in order for the uh, Amer- United States oil companies to be able yeah. to do anything profitably. Well, most people think it's around 70. All right. So we're okay. So I like the number 70. It's a little bit in between. But then at the end, he says something which I just thought was beautiful. So I believe it will stabilize uh, over time. As far as um, um, conspiracy theories are concerned, uh, well, uh. A conspiracy is always possible, but this would be a conspiracy that would be harming uh, and affecting the conspirators more than those who they've been plotting against. Uh, like the I said, castrators? The States, Did he say castrators? I don't know. I didn't hear it. Let me listen. <laughs> harming uh, and affecting the conspirators more than... <laughs> like con- Construators? I'm not sure what he mm-hmm. meant. I don't know what he Those meant. who they've been plotting against. Like I said, in the United States, the national budget is um, uh, it, uh, rely, uh, relies uh, on um, a, uh, an assessment uh, of uh, about 80 uh, or, or of about $90 per, per barrel for oil. So trying to bring uh, oil prices down globally would actually seriously affect uh, oil production in the United States itself. And I don't think uh, America's oil industry would be happy about that. So I do expect uh, prices to stabilize uh, and maybe they will be adjusted for uh, in an upwards trend. We can have one final question, ladies and gentlemen, right now. All right. What if so that was him translating uh, Putin? Yeah, he's still translating Putin. You don't hear okay. Putin at all. And here's the final question. They should have a little Putin noise, just a little bit. I agree. On. I agree. I agree. That's what I would have done. But, you know, here we are, podcasters, not television producers anymore. One final question, ladies and gentlemen, right now. What if, uh, I will tell you later, we have a proverb in Russia. It is a bit crude about uh, a, gram- a-, a grandma and a grandpa. You know, as regards, uh, what if, you know, if if a grandma had a penis, she would be a grandpa. That's how we say. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That's a funny phrase. I know what that. Yeah, I, I, I think I've heard. I've, I've heard it, I've heard it differently. That. I've I've heard. It, yeah, I've heard it differently, too. And I can't. Th- I'm trying to think if of the one queen of had balls, she'd be king. That's what I've heard. Yeah, that sort of thing. But I'd like, I'd like to explain it. It's a, to explain a situation that is not that can't yeah. be changed. Yeah, it's like if if if. if I yeah. just, but I like the Russian version so much about better. It's a, a gram, a, a grandma, and a grandpa. You know, <laughs> as regards, uh, what if you know, if if a grandma had a penis, she would be a grandpa. That's how we say. <laughs> yeah. All right. <laughs> Way to go! Slow clap for Vlad. Hey, man. <laughs> Wouldn't it be great if the president answered that way? Hey, listen. Listen. Yeah. If Michelle had a penis, she'd be uh, president. 
you have to listen to this. This is ABC. They do a report on this Friends of Bill. Uh, there was a WJC VIP, William Jefferson Clinton VIP. And so when $10 billion was made available, we know where it didn't go, Haiti. When $10 billion was made available by USAID, this is not the money that we, that we, the cash that we sent uh, uh, based upon request. You know? We just need cash. I know a lot of people want to send blankets or water. Just send your cash. Now, this is for USAID. And of course, Hillary was, uh, uh, was uh, Secretary of State. And so they had all these requests, all these companies like, yeah, we're going to build tents, you know, we're gonna permanent housing, we're going to temporary housing, we'll do this. And they all were in line and they obviously got preferential treatment. ABC ripped this to shreds. I was surprised. He was the U.N. special envoy to Haiti and she was the secretary of state. We believe in Haiti's promise. And together, the Clintons played prominent roles after the earthquake as for-profit companies and aid organizations rushed in to be part of a $10 billion reconstruction program. Now, new emails between the State Department and the Clinton Foundation, obtained by Clinton's Republican opponents, appear to show that those considered FOB, friend of Bill, or using their initials, WJCHRC friends, got special attention from the State Department. Need you to flag when people are friends of WJC, wrote one State Department official to her counterpart at the Clinton Foundation in one of the emails provided to ABC News. And when you look at the record, people who have been contributors to the foundation or have been close with the Clintons who have benefited from reconstruction in Haiti. The State Department says its only goal was trying to figure out who could best get aid to quake victims as soon as possible. But even before last week's hurricane, we found tens of thousands of people still living in what was supposed to have been temporary shelter. Do you think you'll have a permanent home at some point? No. And while the emails do not indicate no. who did or did not get a contract in Haiti, they do show what happened to those without a connection to the Clintons. Is this FOB? Asked the State Department official of the foundation. If not, they should go to a public website clearinghouse. The foundation told ABC News no special treatment was expected or given in Haiti, or anywhere, says the president. Nothing was ever done for anybody because they were contributor to the foundation. Nothing. One of the biggest beneficiaries of the Clinton reconstruction efforts in Haiti was a Korean garment company recruited to this new industrial park, built at a cost of some $400 million, including almost $175 million in U.S. taxpayer money. The company, called Seya, one of the world's largest garment manufacturers, now has some 9,000 workers in Haiti and proudly shows off the two local schools it built nearby. But the company was selected despite a track record of worker abuse and sexual harassment in Guatemala. Company officials told us those were isolated instances. We've seen the records. This company has a history of that. That is not something he is aware of. I want to thank Chairman Kim and Saya for many things. Mm -hmm. Saya later became a Clinton Foundation donor and his chairman has since helped finance a private business for top Clinton aide Cheryl Mills, who was instrumental in bringing the company to Haiti. Even as the Clintons have been praised for their efforts in an incredibly difficult place to operate, the new emails provide a rare glimpse of the cozy connection between Hillary Clinton's State Department and Bill Clinton's foundation. Mr. Clinton declined to comment for our report, but in a recent appearance, he talked about the issue. I'm sure we made a few mistakes, but way, way more good than harm was oh, done. Yeah. Brian Ross, ABC <laughs> News, New York. What do you say about wow. that, huh? That's a killer. That's clip of the day. Thank you very much. I thought you'd like it. Clip of the day. I mean, and ABC. ABC. Well, ABC, I've said. Yeah, that they seem to be pro-Trump. The former Senate president of Haiti, Bernard Sansiric, I think. Uh, uh, he was on Fox Business News, who have a lot of interesting guests, and he, <laughs> and he kind of rolled it out again. In 2010, we had an earthquake that killed 315,000 people. That's really a deadly earthquake, and millions were left without shelter. President Obama named Bill Clinton as the one that should be in charge of the reconstruction of Haiti. And in that process, the Clinton Foundation through U.S. taxpayers' money and 
people giving money worldwide to the Clinton Foundation for relief effort to Haiti contributed about $14.3 billion. We're talking about billion dollars. Yeah. Okay? And n the Haitian people has not seen not even 2% of that money. 2%? Nothing was done in Haiti. They were given those contracts, they were given millions of dollars from that money, and nothing was actually done in Haiti. Yeah. Uh, Haiti, just like everything the Clinton have done, is pay for play, and they control Haiti, and they have been controlling Haiti since 1994, when they invaded Haiti. I, I mean, what the Clinton have done in Haiti is unbelievable, and the American people should know about it. Mm-hmm. Well, the American people don't know. No, about and it. they probably will never really know about it. No. I don't even know how Bush got involved in this scam and ended up probably scarfing some cash. But the Clintons work for Bush. That's my thesis. Yeah. I don't, I have a different, that's funny you'd say that. Uh, the reason I, I have a slightly different thesis is I think there is a feud between those two groups. Right now. And I, think that, and I think that's why, for example, in a couple of the shows, and I don't have clips to back this up, but I take my word for it, they have made a huge thing about going after Billy Bush, the TV guy. Right, who is related to the Bushes. You didn't see Yeah, he's a nephew. That. Yes. And there was a, there was one package I saw in one of the news shows where, where they had, they dredged up all kinds of just snide comments and off-the-cuff remarks that Billy Bush had made here and there mm. on different programs to, to dis disparage the guy. And I'm watching this going, what's the point? The guy's lost his job. Yeah, he's going to sue and probably do okay by that, but he's going to get his influences done. Mm. And I keep thinking this is a, and this is a, this, the Hillary folks doing this. Well, I think Bushes and the Clintons have a feud going on. Maybe George didn't get his cut like he was promised. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, that would still mean that the Clintons are working for the Bushes if he's waiting for his cut, in my book. The pro the, what I see, you know, Billy Bush was already. Uh, bragging about this tape in August, and NBC had this thing, you know, for a, for a year, um, and they decided the timing, of course, is everything. It's either Billy Bush is uh, taking one for the team, or he's expendable. He's really not important in the story, in, from my book. No, but I, I I just find that's I feel the yeah. same way exactly. Mm -hmm. That's why I find it peculiar. That they're bringing the, all this dredging this stuff up about him yeah. just to make him look bad. It's just I, I, that's brought to, to mind. Maybe, maybe, the, maybe. Bush feud. Maybe it's to cover the obvious trail. Say, oh, well, yeah, we'll just make. It. Look, Billy Bush, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a prediction right now. He will return to NBC. That's my prediction. Well, you say that about everybody that ever worked at NBC. I, no, I don't. <laughs> yes. I do. I never said that. Same with Brian Williams. He will return to NBC. I would like to play a quick soundbite, a pitch, really, from the candidate that I will be voting for. And to reiterate, I vote independent. And the only reason I do that is because the idea, and certainly outside of the United States, that we have a two-party system is uh, is wrong. And it is if no one votes for the independents, then eventually it will only be a two party system. So I I like to keep that alive. And it also keeps me completely independent for the show. I am voting for Vermin Supreme. Here's his pitch to you. Here's his pitch to you. Once again, of course, uh, my name is Vermin Supreme. I am a friendly fascist. I am a tyrant that you can trust and you should let me run your life. As you know, all politicians are vermin, and I am the vermin supreme, and that is why I am the most qualified candidate in this race at this time. Yes, I will promise you anything your little electoral heart desires, because you are my constituents, because you are the informed voting public, and because I have no intention of keeping any promise that I make. So this election year, vote early, vote often, and remember, a vote for me vermin supreme is a vote completely thrown away you got a guy <laughs> i yeah. never heard of him he has a great but this guy with a boot on his head oh i just I, 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 beyond me um but there was another one that came up which i liked a lot this is totally coming from msnbc or the nbc uh, family which you had some good comments about in the newsletter 
Uh, it's, it's, I won't play the opening where he said it, but his uh, Chris Hayes on MSNBC goes to his guest, and the guest takes issue with something that Chris Hayes said at the opening of his show, the opening of his segment about Donald Trump. You know, Chris, and listen, I will address your question, but I first have to address, you said in your, in your polemic, in your introduction, that there is an anti-Semitism, and I have to address this because I couldn't agree, disagree more strenuously with you. Are you saying that Donald Trump can't criticize the media and can't criticize international banks without being accused of some sort of dog whistle of anti-Semitism? Uh, what I said was that it drew on long standing anti-Semitic tropes, uh, the tropes. global cabal of international bankers that she meets with behind closed doors to undermine national sovereignty. I think it is a fair statement to say that does draw on or at least reference those tropes. I can read to you from the protocols of the elders of Zion. You will find strikingly similar language therein. I am not saying that he did that knowingly. Maybe he didn't. But there is there is more than a, a passing similarity between that conceptual area and what he talked about today. Yes. Now, this blah, is blah, blah. Well, a big intellectual hot but wait, shot. But wait, this is bigger than Trump. You got to. Here's what's going on. If you say someone's a globalist, you're a Jew. You're hater. a Jew hater, exactly. And, and you know, we talk. We've talked about this for nine years now. Of course, it's banking system. It's the media. But when you say that, you're saying Jews. Uh, and that's the media who is actually pushing back on that. There's no room for conversation. It's only, oh, I can reach you from the protocol of the elders of Zion. Oh, okay. Oh, jeez. I think uh, I think this is. But they're gonna they're gonna keep pushing that. They're gonna keep pushing. Oh yeah. It. Well, they gotta find every angle they can to get this to work. Uh huh. There was this guy. He's a people. I don't know. There's a Jew hater on the uh, on the on YouTube. Really? Just one? <laughs> There's a Jew here on YouTube who is a Jew. He's kind of a self-loathing Jew who's become uh, a a converted priest in the Orthodox the Orthodox Christian uh, Eastern Orthodox, and he is. Oh wait, this is the guy with the hat. I know who you mean, Brother Nathaniel. Brother Nathaniel. Brother, Brother Nathaniel. Yes, I've I've watched Brother Nathaniel a lot. Sure. <laughs> Brother Nathaniel is as entertaining as. Uh, but- as Manning, that's who I was thinking, yes. He's as entertaining as Manning. And he's this is his thesis. Uh, uh, he has this kind of thesis. What Chris Hayes said is kind of based on reverse engineering Brother Nathaniel. That's the way I see it. So in other words, so I'm I'm guessing and making the accusation that Chris Hayes, the defender of all things Israel, actually watches Brother Nathaniel. <laughs> I'm sure he does. <laughs> <laughs> Of course. What else is he going to do in his spare time? Review his script? Yeah, yeah no. Uh, no, I don't think so. I like. I, I thought it was. Uh, I thought it was pretty funny. Um, it's, it's very. It's sick, actually. You, yeah. it, it, this is just a continuing effort to stop all discourse. Give ourselves. Give our our country away to the global interests and the bankers, and just give up. That's what these guys are all saying. Hey, and Hillary's going to be president. She's going to be all in on this. Yeah. They're following this campaign. He's going to be a little more entertaining now that he's unhinged or whatever. They, uh, what was he said? He's, he's let loose. Unshackled. He's free. Unshackled. Unshackled. Unhinged is funnier. But unshackled. And now he, because he can now do what he, you know, maybe felt obliged not to do because he had supported the party. The party has bailed. They've all scattered around, even though there's, they promise, you know, the thing that still bugs me, and it's not because I like Trump or don't like Trump, but it does bother me that the first debate in the primaries, when they all had to make a pledge, mm-hmm. you know, this was aimed at Trump, yep. to make him make a pledge that you'll support whoever's nominated, saying that you won't run as a third party candidate. The idea was that you won't run as a third party candidate, but at the same time, you're going to support whoever's elected. And they didn't, and oh yeah, we'll do that. And they, with the exception of Carson and, and a couple of other ones, uh, like the guy from New Jersey, Carson, and a few others, the rest of them have lied. They lied. Yeah. I mean, J- Jeb Bush is a perfect example. Yeah. They're, they're not supporting him at all, even though they pledged on t- they pledged to do it. Yes, yes, I, I got your point. They're liars. Gee, surprise. They're liars. <laughs> they're liars. All right. <laughs> gladly uh, admit defeat here or being wrong 
Apparently there were speeches. We thought that I said specifically no speeches, no transcripts. Maybe there were no speeches. Well, it turns out there were speeches and we have snippets coming through. That would just be my last clip for today from the WikiLeaks. Well, what the Clinton campaign is doing here is, is really echoing some of the concerns that I'm hearing from some of my sources in the security research community, which is that the Russian government is using... You Wiki- say your sources, nonpartisan sources? Yeah, I would say that's a fair thing to say. Um, <laughs> yeah, my sources are nonpartisan. Mm-hmm. That you have uh-huh. a, a foreign government that is using uh, WikiLeaks um, as as a tool, uh, some would say, uh, a weapon to influence public opinion. Now, what, uh, what government? influence yeah. the U.S. election means, what influence public opinion means, that doesn't necessarily mean help Donald Trump win. It might just mean so uncertainty, so discord. When you look at what the Russians have been doing or allegedly have been doing, and then you hear the U.S. for the first time sort of naming and shaming the Russians in a very public way, much more than any U.S. officials have ever done from the Chinese, do you get the sense from your sources that they have it buttoned up pretty tight? They have incontrovertible proof that the Russians are behind this? Uh, Certainly in the case of the DNC hack, that is the case. Um, They have not made a public (laughs) attribution with regards to the theft of Mr. Podesta's emails. Um, And they're very, very careful before they say, this is is who it is. How closely aligned are Julian Assange and the Russian intelligence services? That's a really, really good question. No, No, it's not. We don't know. The interesting thing about WikiLeaks is to talk about WikiLeaks is to talk about Julian Assange. It's a very, very small organization. He will claim hundreds of volunteers working for him, but in fact, it looks like it's a one-man shop. Oh, really? That's not true. The, oh, I heard someone um, on, on the news say, super hacker Julian Assange, like he's actually doing it now. Oh, yeah, the story's oh, changing. Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, it's just a one-man shop. He's doing it all by himself. And he's not very clear about where he gets his documents, how he vets them, where they're coming from. Uh, well, into that, into that point. Yeah, he we is. Not- yeah, he's extremely clear about it. <laughs> but no, okay. We have not heard the Clinton campaign confirm or deny the John Podesta email. So we, we don't know if it's Julian Assange in the bottom of the Ecuadorian embassy in London, sort of adding in a little color here and there. Uh, or if it's a true recitation of private email. What is this then- from? Where did you get this? Uh, this is CNN. Man, they, they stink. Yeah. You're getting at, at the heart of this issue is, which is, are these emails authentic or have they been doctored in some uh-huh. way? And with no insight into how he vets his documents. No one has no- said they've been doctored. The Podesta would have said it if it was. Everyone's insinuating that. This is what it is. Yeah, except the people who are, who are owners of the email. Mm-hmm. Into how he vets his documents. There's really no way to know that. So, suffice it to say, there's a lot. Yes, there's a good way to know it. The, the person who's you, you're sending their email out should say, this is bullshit. I didn't write it. That's how you know it. That hasn't happened. Nope. So, suffice it to say, there's a lot in these emails that aren't being made a big deal. I think they're being reported on. Um, and I, th- I think you are seeing individual stories on, on content of the emails. But it's really incumbent upon the candidate himself to raise it to the level of a campaign issue. Oh, so the, here's, here's how it works. Oh, brother, are you kidding me? So in other words, the, whoever's campaigning is the ones who are responsible for getting the news out? Yes, that's oh correct. Oh, my God, this is the worst network ever in history. <laughs> I know. Hey, it only gives you more reason to support the best podcast in the universe because we are here to help you keep your sanity uh, <laughs> i know basic liars it's just i want you to just go up there and make stuff up and lie lie bold-faced lies mm-hmm. well, that's why we exist john that's why the speculation is what it is is the type of speculation yeah. as though they're actually thoughtful yeah that's to me the most annoying part yeah what do they teach them in j school not much well, depends <laughs> on what the meaning of j is. <laughs> exactly all right everybody it's going to be a crazy week because that's how it rolls who knows what could happen before the big debate i'm sure uh forces will be at work i mean holy moly the russians who knows anything could happen i'm excited are you Yes. <laughs> Coming to you from the crackpot condo here in the skyscraper in uh, the swamp of crazy in Austin, Texas. It's FEMA Region 6 in the morning, everybody. I'm Adam Curry.
And from northern Silicon Valley, where I'm going to go outside and take some selfies. I'm John C. Dvorak. (laughs) You'll feel good about it, my friend, that's for sure. We'll return on Thursday with another episode of the best podcast in the universe. Until then, in the morning, everybody, I'm Adam Curry, and see you Thursday. Adios, mofos. Tastes like poop.